Hey everybody, it's Pastor Brian Ross from Grace Life Bible Church in Grand Rapids, Michigan. We want to welcome you once again to this midweek video. We appreciate you tuning in as always. If you haven't already done so, if you would consider subscribing and ringing the alarm bell as a way of staying current with the ministry. When we go live from our assembly building on Sunday morning, as well as when we create content for you here midweek, we would certainly appreciate that. Also want to remind you about our Rumble channel here, Grace Life Bible Church on Rumble. Sorry about that distraction. Uh, we established this as an all-tech site should something happen to our YouTube ministry. So if you're in all-tech sites or like an alternative to YouTube, please consider um, checking us out here on Rumble as well. My featured book in this video is once again my book, The King James Bible in America, this, an orthographic historical and textual investigation. This book covers issues related to the printed history of the text in the United States, covers the copyright myth, as well as uh, some relevant information to this particular series of videos on the built-in dictionary related to dictionaries, defining of words, what words mean, and uh, some of those kinds of concepts, which is why I am uh, promoting that book in this particular series. So this video is the second video in my series on the built-in dictionary. So I recommend that if you haven't already done so, that you stop this video right now and go back and watch the video on explaining and evaluating the built-in dictionary concept first. In that video, I lay things out. I talk about where uh, the, the, the basic concepts of this idea, discuss whether those, those concepts are um, scriptural or not. And so you're definitely going to want this information from the first video in your sort of frame of reference before you watch the, this video currently that I'm introducing right now. What I want to cover in this video is the historical origin of the built-in dictionary concept. That's what we're going to be looking at in this particular video. So without any further delay, let's go ahead and get into the concept of the historical origin of the built-in dictionary concept. In my analysis, no one talked about a, quote, built-in dictionary prior to 1995. No one talked about a built-in dictionary prior to 1995. So the idea that the King James Bible possessed its own built-in dictionary has, was not historically part of the pro-King James position prior to 1995. Now, there's a reason why I'm picking 1995 as a date, as I will explain as we work our way through this. But prior to that point, the idea of a built-in dictionary was not part of the pro-King James argumentation. All right. Now, using a process... Um, that I learned in my master's degree called historiography, I have done an analysis. And what I've done is I've taken all the books in order they were written, and I've, I've read them looking for talk of a built-in dictionary, okay? So none of the following books include the built-in dictionary in their argumentation. Starting with 1930, our authorized Bible vindicated by Benjamin J. Wilkinson, 1930 does not talk about a built-in dictionary. 1955, God wrote only one Bible, J.J. Ray, does not talk about a built-in dictionary. 1956, the King James Version defended by Edward F. Hills, does not talk about a built-in dictionary in the King James Bible. 1964, the Bible Babble by Peter Ruckman, does not talk about a built-in dictionary. 1967, <clears throat> Believing Bible Study by Edward F. Hills, does not talk about a built-in dictionary, okay? 1970, a Christian Handbook of Manuscript Evidence by Peter Ruckman does not talk about a built-in dictionary. 1970, which Bible edited by David Otis Fuller does not talk about a built-in dictionary. 1973, David Otis Fuller, true or false, does not talk about the built-in dictionary. And I know I'm a broken record at this point, 1978, Counterfeit or Genuine, edited by David Otis Fuller. No built-in dictionary concept. 1982, Famine in the Land by um, Norman Ward. No built-in dictionary concept. 1983, Let's Weigh the Evidence by Barry Burton. No, no mention of a built-in dictionary. 1987, Why I Believe the Old King James Bible, Bruce Lackey. No mention of a built-in dictionary. 1987, An Understandable History of the Bible by Samuel Gipp. Pausing here, let's look at something Gipp said, all right? So this is from page 44. This is 1987. Notice this statement. Gipp says, I am not advising running to the Greek. 
I'm advising running to the dictionary and letting the text stand as it reads without the derogatory marks or about archaic words and outdated language and out of date language. So in 1987, when Gip wrote an understandable history of the Bible, he's explicitly telling people that if they don't understand the meaning of words, that they need to go get a dictionary and look up the word. He says, I'm advising running to the dictionary. That's 1987 by Sam Gipp. So there's no notion there of a built-in dictionary, and you don't need to use an English dictionary. That's Gipp from 1987. 1989, Gipp's answer book, a help book for Christians. No mention of a built-in dictionary. 1993, William P. Grady, Final Authority. Okay, No mention of a built-in dictionary. Gail Ripplinger, 1993, her first book, New Age Version, New Age Bible Versions, 1993, no mention of a built-in dictionary. So, so far, there's been no pro King James literature that I have been able to identify in book format. So far, we're at 1993 right now that have that has used that terminology. Also written in 1993 is this book, Which Translation Should We Trust? A Defense of the Authorized King James Version of 1611. And this is by a gentleman named Timothy S. Morton. And let's check this out for this part. Um, Here we go. He's talking about archaic words. This may be true, you say, but there are still words in the authorized version I don't understand. Come on now, what do you think dictionaries are for? Anytime you come to a word, you are in doubt. Anytime you come to a word, you are in doubt of consult a dictionary. So 1993, here's another example in pro King James argumentation of people being encouraged to consult a dictionary when they don't understand the meaning of a word. Okay. So now we've just run a whole list of books, starting with 1930, coming all the way down to 1993, with no mention of a built-in dictionary. Okay. Now, the other thing that I did is I have access to this Google Drive that is full of books contained by P- PDFs of books contained by Peter Ruckman. Um, this, contain, this contains an extensive, but it's not exhaustive, catalog of Ruckman's books in PDF format. Okay. So I went through each and every one of the titles in this list. There are a bunch of them, even though it is not exhaustive, it is very extensive as far as the number of titles in Ruckman's library. And I searched each one of these books individually and found no reference to a built-in dictionary in the King James Bible in any of these works by Ruckman. Instead, Ruckman can be found referencing his readers, referring his readers to the English Dictionary We're talking about the idea that the Bible, if you compare verse with verse, can and does define its own terms, okay? Now, I have a whole document that I prepared on that. I'm not going to get into it because it'll take too long, but I have conducted that research. The other thing that I've done in preparation for this is I've gone to the Bible Baptist Bookstore online, that's Ruckman Store, and I bought all of the Bible Believers Bulletins from 1978 to 2023, I bought every single one of them in PDF format. Here's all my files. So 1978 all the way to 2023, I searched every year, every month of the entirety of the of Ruckman's bulletin. So I purchased the PDF copies of every issue of the BBB from its inception in 1978 through 2023 and searched each month for occurrences of the word dictionary. From 1978 through 1995, there are zero references to a built-in dictionary. Zero. From 1978 through 1990, uh, during that time period, instead one finds references to specific English dictionaries, such as Merriam-Webster, the Oxford English Dictionary, and Noah Webster's American Dictionary of the English Language from 1828. Occasionally, there are general references to, quote, defining scripture with scripture or biblical definitions, but there is never any concept discussed related to a built-in dictionary. So there is zero evidence before 1995 through a swath of data that I've considered here in the preparation of this of these videos. There's zero evidence before 1995 of the idea of a built-in dictionary was part of pro-King James argumentation. 
So then what happened in 1995 to change that? Why have I selected 1995 as the date? <clears throat> Something significant happened in 1995. And that was John Ankerberg for the John Ankerberg show had a now infamous, I'll say, Bible version debate slash roundtable discussion for the John Ankerberg show. And what this was, was three uh, King James, only us three King James advocates were invited to the Ankerberg show and four modern version advocates, including uh, James White, Dan Wallace, uh, Bob Wilkin, Farstead, and, and uh, I think it's Baker from the NIV committee, uh, were the modern translation advocates. And on the other side were Sam Gipp, Chambers, and Strauss for the King James, okay? During the filming of these episodes, there was an exchange between Sam Gipp and Dan Wallace and James White regarding the English Dictionary, okay? In my opinion and through my analysis, it is my contention that in this moment, because of the struggle that Gipp has to answer the question that is posed to him, in this moment is where the King James built-in dictionary concept is birthed. It's born in this moment. The seeds of it are planted here. And then from there, they germinate over a couple years. And then by 1998, Gail Ripplinger is releasing the language of the King James Bible, discovering its hidden built-in dictionary. Now, my sources do conflict a little bit um, about what happened here on the Ankerberg Show. On the Ankerberg Show, they recorded eight 30-minute episodes where they discuss issues related to this, and it's unclear to me if all eight of those eventually aired on TV or if only two of them did. I've read some stuff that says that only two of the episodes actually aired on television. The rest of them people would have had to purchase, um, so I'm, I'm unclear on the details, but there's a conversation specific to the English Dictionary and the King James Bible as part of this Anchorberg show that I want you to listen to. And yes, I am saying that this is the moment when the seeds were planted for the built-in dictionary concept as part of pro-King James argumentation, an idea that did not exist prior to this exchange. Here we go. Okay, there's, there's Let me ask you, let's, let's take this a different tack then. Do you use an English dictionary? Uh, periodically. Do you encourage your uh, congregation to use an English dictionary? I'm not a pastor. Well, would you encourage the layperson who reads the King James Bible to use an English dictionary? As long as that dictionary did not correct the King James Bible. And what is the English dictionary you'd require? Um, they'd have to look at them. Because the, you mean you've the not one thought that, about this the issue? One that, uh, All the English know, dictionaries are, are, modern, are modern language dictionaries. Now, one of the, one of the ones that uh, a lot of people are using are Webster's 1828, but West, Webster's 1828 is 200 years after the King right. James Bible. So what do it you probably use? is a good dictionary compared to what's out there today, but... Uh, so what do you use? How do you understand the words of the King James Bible? Well, I read them. Without read them. a dictionary that helps you understand what, what it meant. Goodness, you mean tell me you think I have to have a dictionary every time I read the King James Bible? Well, the, here's the problem that I've faced. 300 of those words plus have changed their meaning in the last 400 years. And it seems to me that the King James only people use those words in whatever, yes, it's documented in the introduction of the RSV. Well, that's, yeah, and that's a very broad, that's a very broad it, representation. It, it there might be 30 that have changed where somebody needed an explanation. It gives the words. It's okay, shambles is marketplace. Okay. All right, now, well, let's, let's, let, me, now let's, let me finish my point, please. All right. The point is that if these words have changed in time, and you don't know which dictionary to use to find out what they mean, then how do you know that you're telling us what it means in 1611 or in 1995? Here's the thing. Shambles, uh, again, shambles means marketplace. It's to say... Uh, what I use is First uh, Samuel chapter nine. Talk about archaic words. In First Samuel chapter nine, you have Saul, the son of Kish. Uh, his father's lost some jackasses. Kish or, or Kish sends his son Saul to go find him. Uh, it says there in verse uh, nine, uh, they, he's going to go see the seer. He's going to go see uh, Samuel, the seer. And it says in First Samuel nine nine, uh, that which was before time called a prophet was now, or before time was called a seer is now called a prophet, showing that the word seer had passed from popular usage, and the word prophet had moved. So I just want to point out that that is explicit in the text. The text is telling you that what aforetime was called a seer is now called a prophet. It's explicit. It's tell, The text is telling you that that's what word, the words meant. 
Okay. So, and this is Gip who up to this point in 1987 had told people to run to a dictionary. And now he's struggling a little bit with Wallace's question. Placed it in popular usage at the time for Samuel 9 was written. But when you get down to verse 11, where the word seer appears, the Lord did not, when he had Samuel write it, he did not have him write prophet, he had him write seer. He left the word in the text. I would not update the King James Bible. I, what does the word Dr. prove? The King James translators would. Dr. Gip, let me, let me, let me this is nice. completely circular. And what it, what it, and the dangerous thing is, when you say, well, I just understand the words, people can bring their own traditions to a text, and they read those words within light of their own traditions and say, well, that's just what the Bible says. You have no external way of verifying those things. That's a, that's a frightening so thing, how, but it, keeps going, it, keeps going, it keeps going in circles. That's the question you should have asked yourself a long time ago. Oh, no, what dictionary are you going to use? Because if every dictionary is going to change, then the word will change. What this is, is exactly the point we're trying to raise. Translations need to change to make sure that we maintain the faith so that people can understand the Word of God. If you have a 1611 translation where we don't even use those words the same anymore, you actually have a changing tradition. Yours is changing far more than ours is. We're trying to get back to the original with, with every generation. Anyway, I propose that this exchange between Gip and Wallace and White was the origin of the built-in dictionary concept. King James advocates watched these episodes of the Ankerberg show with great interest, including Gail Ripplinger. Ripplinger's book, New Age Bible Versions, was explicitly discussed and quoted from during the Ankerberg show. And it's also my understanding that Gail Ripplinger's book came out in 1993, New Age Bible Versions. It caused a major stir, and that is one of the impetuses for this Ankerberg uh, show to begin with. OK, so there's a this it is this exchange that is difficult for people to wrap their mind around in the pro King James space. And from there, it's where people start to uh, develop the concept of a built in dictionary. So now if we go to 1997, let's go to 1997. And we want to look at this piece, Fighting Back, a handy reference for King James Bible believers. And this is by uh, James L. Melton. And if we go here to page 23, we'll see something occur that we haven't seen yet. Okay. And let me find this here. Right here. Okay. Uh, notice here on Genesis chapter 1, verse 29. Uh, omit the word meat, since there is no real flesh in this verse, only plant life. This will destroy the cross-references to the meat offering of Leviticus 2, which is really a grain offering with no flesh. Now, now that's a comparison. That's a cross-reference. But now notice, the Bible has its own built-in dictionary. But let's not allow people to know it. So here we have 1997 for the first time that I can find and locate in any Pro King James argumentation the idea of a built-in dictionary, and this is post the Ankerberg show from 1995. And then we come down here, look at Genesis chapter 22, verse 1. The word tempt in this verse should be replaced with try. So he's responding to things that modern version advocates say here. Here's another case of the built-in dictionary. So we see here for the first time in 1997, post-1995, with Melton's piece here, Fighting Back, a handy reference guide for King James Bible believers, the idea of a built-in dictionary, okay? And then 1998 saw the publication, make sure I get this right, 1998 saw the publication of The Language of the King James Bible, Discover Its Hidden Built-in Dictionary, a full-length book work devoted exclusively to the built-in dictionary concept, released in the spring of 1998. Okay, Ripplinger's book was King James Onlyism's response to the dictionary exchange in the Ankerberg show or on the Ankerberg show in 1995. Ripplinger's book was specifically criticized on the Ankerberg show. The response to the dictionary exchange there with Gip, Wallace, and White is, in my opinion, this book. The language of the King James Bible discover its hidden built-in dictionary, all right? So I purchased a copy of this book in April 1998 as a 20-year-old Bible college student who was engaged at the time in some very heated exchanges at Bible college related to text and translation. 
And I bought this book hoping that it would be able to help me at a time when I really needed some help. Okay. 1998 is Ripplinger's book. Now, this is also mentioned by Ruckman in the uh, November 1998 Bible Baptist Bulletin. And here's Ruckman. Get the work by Gail Ripplinger called The Language of the King James Bible, AV Publications, 1998. And note uh, not only the poetic cadences and sentences and verses, but in the words themselves. So Ruckman says and mentions this book in the bulletin for the first time in November 1998. So conclusion of this video. The built-in dictionary concept was not part of pro-King James argumentation before 1995. It developed as a King James-only response to the Ankerberg Show exchange between Gip, Wallace, and White. Ripplinger's 1998 book, The Language of the King James Bible, codified the idea, the concept of a built-in dictionary as part of the orthodoxy of the King James-only movement that then got picked up on and then advanced I'm going to say in sort of an uncritical way, as a way of dealing with the difficulty that existed in that Ankerberg clip, but over defining the dictionary. Okay. So does the Bible have a built-in dictionary? I'm going to say, in my opinion, no, not by definition of what a dictionary is. And the fact that the word dictionary is not in a King James Bible. So the concept of a built-in dictionary, the way it's been enunciated by Ripplinger and others, is developed and then imposed on the King James Bible. It's not germane to the King James Bible itself. And the idea of it did not exist in pro-King James argumentation prior to 1995. It is a response to what happened on the Anchor Bird Show, first mentioned in 1997 by Melton in his short piece, and then a full book-length work in early 1998 by Gail Ripplinger. That is what I am putting forth in this video as the origin of this concept. Now, in future lessons, we're going to look at other aspects of this. But for now, in this video, that is what I wanted to cover. So, I am certain that there are going to be some that are watching this that are not thrilled with what I've just said. Um, there are going to be others who are going to be happy to know the backstory and the information. What I've said so far, I don't think is disputable based upon historical facts and evidence. I don't think it's disputable. Um, the, uh, the, the reality is that no one before this point argued for a built-in dictionary the way that it has been enunciated by Ripplinger in her 1998 book. And I do believe that is a response to what happened on the Anchorbrook show in 1995. So stay tuned for further episodes on this topic as we look at some other aspects of the concept of the built-in dictionary. Thanks for your attention. And as always, if you've never trusted Jesus Christ, if you've never relied exclusively on his shed blood for you on the cross, his death, his burial, his resurrection, as the only total complete payment for sin, trust Jesus Christ today before it's everlasting too late. Thanks for your time. Thanks for your attention. And we'll see you next time.